It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, <laughs> comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, uh, publishing comics, writing and drawing comics, and comics lifestyle. And this is going to be an episode about comics lifestyle. I've been teasing that for far too long. We're actually going to talk about uh, the topic today is uh, living well on less as a cartoonist. And I am joined by a stellar round table of guests, <laughs> uh, both virtual and real. Uh, let's start with, with the person who's beaming in via the internet, uh, C. Spike Trotman, Iron underscore Spike on the Twitters, author of Poor Craft. Funny book, Fundamentals of Living Well on Less. Hi, Spike. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also the creator of Templar, Arizona, and which we'll talk about later. We're going to talk about uh, <laughs> smut peddler, which are words that I'm sure nobody who ever watched the show ever expected to hear come out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we're going to talk about that uh, later I on. I come prepared to talk money and smut and alternate universes. I'm ready to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're going to cover the gamut today. And then, so thank you for being here today, Spike. No it, problem. I'm really glad to be here. And uh, then in, in studio, we have Lorianne Uy. Did I get that right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Lorianne, uh, Southern California expat. Mm -hmm. Los now, Angeles. Los Angeles, California, now living in Michigan, yeah. in lovely Ann Arbor, Michigan, which it's especially lovely in February. Surviving the winter. <laughs> yeah. How, how's your first winter treating you? Uh, I've become really best friends with my North Face jacket. <laughs> <laughs> it's like down, and it's just like my best friend every single day. <laughs> and you are Laura Bits on the Twitter. Yes, I am. And uh, LauraBits.com mm -hmm. is where we can find your work. And yeah, uh, uh, another cartoonist who lived in Ann Arbor for a while, Janie Ho of Chicken Girl. Design.com and Chicken Girl on the Twitters. Uh, she she came from New York City. Uh, no, no, she came from someplace. Where did she move from? But she, when she came to Ann Arbor, she did a comic about her first winter here, and then when she had to don the puffy coat, right, which right. she never had to do before. But you know, it's like it's just natural yeah. here, right? It's no big deal. If I had time, I'd be doing that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but thank you. It's it's great to have you in studio. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. And then returning to the show, we have Dave Carter. Hey, thanks, Jersey. Um, so not a cartoonist, but longtime Michigan resident. Um, <laughs> I, I have five different winter coats for all the different <laughs> degrees <laughs> of winter weather that we have here. Good in, strategy. In <laughs> so, so yes, Dave reads comics on Twitter right. and uh, yet another comics blog. Yep. Blogspot. Com. Uh, and your title is? I am, among other things, the video game archivist and comic book buyer for the University of Michigan Library. Ooh. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> so this is a guy you want to know, Spike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can get it. <laughs> no, this is one of the ways that, that we uh, Spike and I kind of sort of virtually met, is that you put out a call on Twitter saying, like, like uh, you wanted more librarians to purchase your wares because they're yes. good. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, and this show happens to be produced at a library. We have a lot of librarians on it. But, but you... you you are a university librarian, so it's right. a different game. Like when mm -hmm. you go to the collection there, uh, it's library bound books. You actually bind the books properly. Right, yeah. We put 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 these flimsy comics and we put them in hard covers, put them on the shelf, Ooh. and we plan to keep them for years and years and years. So generations of folks can can look at your stuff in the future. And we'll talk more about this later. Yeah, in the second half of the show. Yeah, yeah awesome. but, but anyway, but yeah. So have, have you been to the Deuterstadt yet? Uh, not yet. You can go check out that collection. Definitely it's, have to check it out. And there's a video game collection there where you can go play <laughs> video games and they, you have like every conceivable system, mm -hmm. even the Famicom. And the yeah, we've got like 40 some different system video game systems oh there. Oh my god. Yeah. What about wow. the Wonder Swan? Do you have that? I do. I've got a color <laughs> Wonder Swan. Oh, wow. <laughs> Bad respect. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Your cloud score just went up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, okay, so yeah. let's get to topic uh, for the first half of the show. We're going to talk about living well on less, managing your finances as a cartoonist. Um, and I want to I lead with the big idea, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. And this is going to refer a lot to the book called Poor Craft, which mm -hmm. Spike worked on with the talented Diana Knock of Jinxville.com. Very com. talented Diana Knock. Oh, she's from another planet. She's so good. Yeah, uh, exactly. The, the intrepid it's girl something bot. this world's never seen before. <laughs> and this is what it looks like. So we can pull it up on camera. Oh, sure. Yeah. Right there. That's the cover, and the two people on the cover that are in black and white are the main characters. Uh, the girl with the black hair and the bandana, no relation, is Penny. And the light-haired girl, who looks kind of perplexed, is Mill. 
And uh, they are kind of our guides through the world of how not to have a miserable life when you don't have a lot of money. Because All the people in color on the back are poor, are poor craft backers from Kickstarter who paid for a spot on the cover. Oh, oh cool. That's a good reward. That's <laughs> a good reward. Second segment. <laughs> uh, but that's the thing is that, uh, you know, there's, there is a buck to be made in comics. Oh, yes. Yes. But it's tough. Uh, I once gave advice to a, a former student who was in college and they were trying to wrestle with this idea of like, I'm not getting everything I wanted out of college. I think I'm good enough to just jump into a freelance career. And they said, you know, should I drop out? Should I stay in school? And I said, well, here are your options. And I said, if you stay in school, this, this, and this will probably happen. But if you drop out and you decide to go into freelance work and I think you're good enough, uh, you're going to have to get a tax ID number. You have to get a doing business as license. license. You're going to have to start managing your taxes, paying them quarterly. There's a lot of work that goes into this. And here's the thing. There's no promises that you're actually going to make any money on this. So yeah. this is why your book has been mentioned on the show a bunch of times, Spike, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, we have to brace ourselves for, you know, uh, I, I make a living. A living, <laughs> <laughs> but my car is thirteen years old. Yeah, <laughs> you know? uh, it's like you, you, you don't. There's no guarantee you're gonna make a ton of money. So uh, no. this and that bothers a lot of people. The fact that there's no guarantee that it's not like a salaried position where you go in, you put in your eight hours, and it, every two weeks you get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of people ask me, you know, it's like how can I, how can I make it the highest level of likelihood? You know, how can I stack the deck in my favor mm -hmm. that I will eventually make a living out of it. And you kind of need to let them down gentle where if you're going to go this, it's like, I only know how to do things one way. I, I know how to do the super independent walk my own road kind of cartooning path. I've, I've never worked for Marvel. I've never worked for DC. I've never done freelance illustration. And I was cartooning for about three years before I made a dime. And that's something you need to be prepared for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's something where I think, Dave, you can chime in on this, is it's a different world we're living in now than one, say, 30 years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, you have you have more choices. Yeah, um, that's true. But that means you also have more routes to try and fail at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it used to be if you didn't get a gig with one of the big comics publishers, your Marvels, your DCs, your Harveys, your Disneys, your whatever. Charlton. Charlton. Um, and there were, you know, there were step. You could step up from Charlton to DC or something like that. Mm -hmm. Now you can go off and put your stuff on the web and see if people like it and build a community, and yeah. then find out if people are willing to give you money for stuff you do, or mm -hmm. if they're willing to pay for a printed version of your web comic, or if they want a T-shirt or something like that, or if they're willing to fund a Kickstarter for you to do your mm -hmm. next your next big thing. Mm -hmm. um, but that means that. Like so, there's so many different paths now. It's hard to say. Well, these are the steps one needs to take to become a cartoonist. Yeah. yeah. And in my opinion, asking people who are kind of established cartoonists who've been cartooning for ten years is kind of like misguided because it's the internet. You know, <laughs> ten yeah, years and everyone ago has their completely own way, yeah. different than now. Yeah. It was, it's it was, like there are people who could be like, oh, well, how do you get started in comics? Well, you start posting on Usenet. <laughs> you know, that's. <laughs> right. I mean, that worked 10 years ago. Uh -huh. You need to think now. You need to think Kickstarter. You need to think cheap hosting. You need to think going to cons and passing out minis. There's always going to be some sort of tried and true methods that transcend changes in technology. But the technology plays such an important role in being an independent creator right now that you always have to be willing to try new things and go down new paths and do stuff maybe your favorite established cartoonists have never done because it wasn't around when they were at the level you're at right now. Yeah, this definitely is, a time of uh, experimentation. You know, like mm -hmm. you're just going to have to try and throw things at the wall and see what sticks. But mm -hmm. um, I think that's actually very empowering. I mean, for someone yeah. like me that just started out and like had no idea how to do things, we just tried and tried and tried. And um, uh, I think about Seth Godin. He's like a marketing uh, guru that I just like reading his books about that. And um, Jason Brubacher also mentioned how it's like, it's all about tribe building now and just finding the people mm -hmm. that are interested in your work and cultivating that and building that audience. And um, yeah. it's not about like knocking on these gatekeepers and just trying to get into the industry that way. It's, it's, yeah. it's all like very kind of localized now and, and yeah uh, yeah if that makes any sense it, no, yeah it does and jason brubaker we should give a shout out to another comics podcast he does the making comics podcast does, where they talk about a lot of this kind of stuff too it's kind of like the uh what is it the thousand true fans theory yes. yeah. Uh, yeah. artistic success where all you need to be 
an artistic success by any measure is a thousand people willing to spend a hundred dollars on you a year. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's a, it's a sliding scale. Like it's not exactly a thousand fans. Like yeah. for you, it's probably like less. And you know, no, it's me, like it's Dave like, Sim said, there's yeah. 2000 pages of crap. You got to get through before Absolutely. you get the good stuff. Yeah, that's, that's exactly yeah, the numbers. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> the therapist guide to making comics. I bought that in my comic shop when I was a teenager and my dad was a cheapskate. That's where I get it from. And Every summer we would drive between 16 and 20 hours from the suburbs of D.C. down to Dothan, Alabama. And I was in the car reading the service guide to making comics. <laughs> here. And I was like, oh, my God, this is this is genius. I'm going to make comics. I'm going to work for Slave Labor Graphics. But I'm going to go in at 8 and punch my card and then leave at 5 and punch my card because I'm an idiot. And I think this is how comics work because I'm a teenager. Right. Oh. right. So- <laughs> We all had dreams. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk. I want to talk about managing finances here, and I want to start with a yeah. big question. Mm-hmm. A big question, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of some of the stuff in Porecraft. Is mm-hmm. um, it can't be as simple as just eat ramen noodles, right? No, no. I mean, that, that, that that's a simplistic way of looking at this thing. So I want to start with a more abstractish question that will hopefully be something you can wrestle with. Is you know, you talked about just a second ago, Spike, about how you you had this one outlook when you were a teenager, and mm-hmm. you have a different outlook now. If you can identify what is one major way that your thinking about finances has changed since becoming a, entering into the world of professional cartooning, right? Because there's there's no like threshold of like I was a prof- I wasn't a professional I am a professional. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a gray line to cross. But as you were crossing whatever threshold that was, mm-hmm. what's one significant way that your thinking changed about the way you handle money and finance your finances? Um. Like I said, early on, I had the realization there was going to be no paycheck, you know, with health insurance and 401k taken out. Um, The idea that if I had a good year or if I had a bad year, it was going to be entirely up to me. And again, this is all from the independent cartoonist perspective, you know, not working freelance, not doing illustration. And the idea that every dime I make was going to be a dime I had to work for. And I had to save and cut corners wherever I could. If I was going to do a con in Scranton or whatever, I had to find a floor to crash on. And I wasn't above crashing on the floors of fans and readers. I wasn't above crashing on the floor of people I'd met two or three times at a con. Uh, I would go to the discount. I still do go to the discount airline sites and find the absolute cheapest flight. If it meant I had to fly in at 4 a.m. and wait at the airport for four hours for my ride, that was fine. You know, um, I was just cutting as many corners, doubling up on tables, in some cases tripling up on tables. So we each got a third of a table, which wasn't a big deal back when I had like two or three books. And uh, skipping out on the party, the after con party where – Everyone knows, anyone who's done a Comic-Con, when the hall closes down, everyone comes out from behind their tables and they go, oh, what are we doing? What are we doing? Are we going out for Japanese? Are we going to the bar? What are we doing? No, I don't know what you're doing. I'm going back to my hotel room to eat a cheese sandwich, so (laughs) that's what I did. And I did that for years and years. And to a degree, I still do that. Every once in a while, I'm like, you know what, screw this. I'm taking a cab. But Still, I just I cut as many corners as I could. I made every dollar count. I made each con as profitable as I possibly could. I learned how to sell my book. I learned the whole elevator pitch thing. Describe your book in a sentence, then describe it in three sentences, and then describe it in a paragraph. I tried to pull in as many buyers as possible. Um, All the money I made on Project Wonderful, the webcomic banner ad site, I never took it out of Project Wonderful. I just used it for more advertising. And all the money I got, I saved. And over a period of seven years, I saved enough money to cover the page rates on Smut Peddler and Porecraft. And that was kind of my plan from from day one. So wait a second, wait a second. You (laughs) paid artists to work on books with you? What is this nonsense? This is the 21st century of of (laughs) comics where we do everything on spec, I thought. Yeah, honestly, it's kind of interesting. I I get people. It's like, oh, I want to put together an anthology, and my first question is like, well, you're gonna you're gonna pay the people, right? And they're like, well, I can't afford it. It's like, I understand that. I've been there, but you know, the best way to get people to actually produce the work they're gonna produce, pay them. <laughs> you know, if there's an incentive, a cash incentive, then the pages actually appear instead of everyone getting super excited, you know, in a in a forum talking about the awesome project they're going to do. And the project just sort of 
never materializes because people have other stuff they want to do and oh well you know I, it doesn't pay you should be grateful for the fact I'm even involved you know this is charity work you know it's just no just if you want to put together a project if you are a writer can't draw and you're looking for an artist or the other way around um you deserve a page rate the artist deserves a page rate and that's how you not it sounds horrible because it sounds like I'm talking about a dog but that's how you sort of get loyalty to the project when someone knows a paycheck is waiting for them at the end of this page it's just human nature mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you want to make sure your project actually comes to pass pay the people involved mm -hmm. the only person who isn't paid uh, at the outset of all my projects is me that's it I, I think that we've got a pull quote for this episode. Uh, uh, I want to I hear from Laura. Uh, what about you? What, how's your thinking changed since doing this? Because you've been, you got, I mean, you got a book here? Yeah. Got yeah. off topic there. Sorry. No, no, no. That was, that was definitely related. Yeah, sure. that was definitely helpful. I was writing notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I start, when I, after I graduated, I had a full-time job. and But I always knew that I, was, I wanted to do a graphic novel of my own. Um, and it was just a matter of like coming up with the idea and then actually like sitting down to work on it. But while I, I had that full time job, I started really thinking about finances. Well, you know, if I'm going to be writing a book, you know, how much time would I need? And would I be like, would I have uh, a job or uh, something to help me, you know, as I as, as I'm writing the book? And so I started saving up a lot, like emergency funds and um, retirement funds like I, I started really researching into those and like taking it really seriously because in case uh, things don't go well for the company because this was a startup um, that I'd be prepared to uh, make that leap <laughs> into <laughs> unemployment territory. <laughs> and uh, true enough, uh, I got laid off because um, yeah, the economy was pretty bad in 2008. Um, and uh, that's when I said like, okay, you know, this this is it. I had I had my buffer, and I was gonna definitely start working on on the book by then. So um, even before I started thinking about comics, like as a as a reality for me, I was like already thinking about um, uh, finances and uh, just the. I don't know how to say it. It's like it's it's my uh, day to day reality. Is like the I I needed to pay my loans, student loans was yeah, a, yeah. was a big deal. Um, you know, rent and utilities. I had to save up for all of that. And yeah. Okay. So so, so <laughs> what I'm hearing here, there's some common language I'm picking up on here that I want to sort of underline is, we could say, suck it up, kid. Comics is life of sacrifice, and if you don't have the guts, the uh, 1929 chutzpah. Uh, mm -hmm. to put up with, uh, you know, uh, sacrificing, then get out. Or is this, is it, is it sacrifice or is it prioritizing? That's, that's the question I've got. Prioritizing to my mind. It's yeah. like, definitely prioritizing. if you are the kind of person that you will say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to live in a shared house where I only have to pay $350 worth of rent a month for one room and access to the bathroom and the kitchen. And I am going to take the Greyhound bus to all the cons because it's, you know, $25 or whatever. And I'm going to split my table and I'm going to make print on demand, maybe a hundred books because that's all I can afford now. If you're willing to start at the bottom, that's probably the best indicator of how willing you are to stick with it. Because there are people I've seen who they've started a webcomic and six months in, they're almost indignant. They're like... Uh, where where are my thousands of fans? Where's my five thousand dollars? I showed up. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. I showed up. Where's my money? And there, I I swear there was one person. His name escapes me, but he actually had a countdown on his site, like a uh, you know, this many days until, like people have for New Year's, and it was all like I'm giving myself a year to become a professional web cartoonist, and it, it counted down from a year, and I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> I literally don't know one person. That made it in a year, you know, that started a comic and a year later they were making fat stacks. You know, I, I, that person <laughs> yeah. doesn't exist. You have to be in this for the long, long haul. It's a career, you know. Where uh, this idea that somehow being a cartoonist is a get rich quick thing came from is I, I have no idea. It's bizarre. So, OK, <laughs> let's talk about some of the things in Porecraft because there's a preview that's available on the website ironcircus.com slash store. Mm -hmm. And you've got a table of contents in there. 
And I'm yes. just wondering if we can just pull from a couple of the tips that are in the book. Absolutely. Uh, uh, housing, food, fashion, health, transportation, entertainment, education, and emergencies. You've got all these bases covered in this book for the person. Now that we scared, you know, all these prospective cartoonists <laughs> of how hard it is and how much. Gonna... <laughs> now we can offer some actual, like, useful. Like, what are some of the things that we'll find in this book and why people should get it? Um, well, a lot of it is focused on urban and suburban frugal living. I I can't speak for rural um, frugal living because I've never experienced it. But uh, I grew up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and they were unwalkable. They I was maybe four miles from the closest bus stop, which would then take you to the subway, and then the subway would take you to the city. It was for people that were content with 40-mile um, trips one way to work and then 40 miles home every day. Oh it was gosh. the quintessential unsustainable suburb. <laughs> and when I moved to the city, I was shocked by how easily I could get to everything. I don't even own a bike because where I live right now, I walk everywhere. I walk to the dentist. I walk to the doctor. I walk to the vet. I walk to the grocery store. I walk to the movie theater. Everything is completely walkable. And of course that saves me like a ton of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think location is probably the most important thing in um, in port and just if you're going to try and live as frugally as possible, just making sure you live in a place where you're not even if you can help it dropping 250 on a subway ticket one way every day. And Okay. I'm not sure if that covered it. But. Well, no. but, but yeah, but yeah, I, I would mm -hmm. throw in I mean, as a guy who grew up in a rural area. Mm -hmm. uh, housing is dirt cheap in rural areas. <laughs> oh, it is, it is. <laughs> so, but you, you, the penalty you pay is yeah. Transportation is a huge mm -hmm. problem because where I grew you up, need a truck. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You really do. I mean, uh, and getting to the airport to go to a convention, forget about it. You know, yeah. you're gonna have to drive. I three have my hours. choice of airports where I live. Over so, there is Midway. Over there is O'Hare. Mm -hmm. so. I will say for any cartoonists who are looking for a place to live, though, Ann Arbor does have fairly affordable outlying areas, and we got a great public transportation system. So yeah, yeah. there's this. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a good public transportation system for Michigan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, there's this uh, idea people have that they need to move someplace to make their career happen. And every once in a while you'll hear about someone, oh, I've got to move to, I'm going to move to LA. I'm going to move to New York. And it's like, well, that's great. But have you taken a look at the uh -huh. rents in LA and New York? Mm, and yes. there's no way you're going to find a place you can live when you're on the very first rung of cartoonist ladder you know, I have friends who are living in Minneapolis right now, and they're renting part of a house, like a house, for four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. But there are people who want to move to New York, and they want to rent their own place, a studio for twelve hundred. Like that's <laughs> right. like no. Yeah, yeah that's not gonna that's happen. Not no. I'm pretty that's happy to leave LA. You don't need to be anywhere if you know these days. If you want to make a web comic or you know be part of the web comic community, although mm -hmm. in my opinion, it's so diverse and fragmented now. There are so many different little communities. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what about what about food though? I mean, because ah, you know, I mean that ra look. ramen noodles. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> if we could if we could pull one tip out of there, because like I I was thinking about it. Like there's the ramen noodles joke, and then mm -hmm. there's that Simpsons joke with discarded pizza boxes are a good source of cheese. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> uh, but 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 beyond that, I mean, like what 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 is learn like what's like one great tip that you learn to cook? Learn to cook. That's the one thing people are like, oh no, but ramen noodles are super cheap. It's like, no, I, I guess if if that's what you want to eat for three meals a day, you <laughs> could argue that ramen noodles at 15 cents, if you don't put anything in them, mm -hmm. are super cheap. Mm -hmm. But is that something you should really be doing? Probably not, because you'll end up all like malnutrition. <laughs> <laughs> but no, just serious. I'm not saying that everyone should go to the local co-op and buy organic free trade quinoa or anything. I'm mm -hmm. just saying go to your local supermarket and get fresh ingredients or frozen ingredients or whatever's on sale because a lot of the name brand stuff goes on insane sales. And just take that home and learn to make it into food. Learn to make it into, you know, tomato sauce or, you know, fried rice. Fried rice is the easiest. I think recipes for fried rice are actually kind of bizarre because all it is is what's in the fridge. Okay. <laughs> mixing it with rice and it's delicious and it's completely simple and anyone can learn to make rice. And if you have vegetables and rice in the fridge, congratulations, you have food. That's it. That's a meal. And people are, there are so many people who don't know how to roast a chicken. It's like cookery 101. It's the, one of the most basic things on earth you can learn. 
go to the supermarket, find the chickens that are on sale. They're a buck a pound. Take them home, prepare them, roast them. Congratulations. You can now eat for a week. Are you sure you want ramen? I would. <laughs> So learn do, to cook. That's my one piece of advice when it comes to food. Just learn to cook. Do you cook, Laura? Um, not be- well because I have a boyfriend who loves cooking. Uh, <laughs> or, <laughs> or hook up with somebody who likes to cook. That's a good strategy, guys. <laughs> now, and, I- yeah. Um, ever since we went uh, semi-vegan, it's been um, you know cheaper for us too. We've just like because uh, we're Filipinos and love our rice. We have rice mm-hmm. all the time and just grab vegetables, saute them. It's really simple, but um, yeah, it's been nutritious and lost a few pounds since then <laughs> so yeah, yeah it so was like, like it's totally doable yeah. yeah and you just get a simple cookbook like uh vegan with a vengeance mm. by, uh, <laughs> Moscovitz, uh or something like that and there's mm-hmm. like a million like go-to 20 minute recipes in there so yeah learning yeah, to cook yeah. and then as a, as, a, as a stay-at-home husband who does the shopping <laughs> you you learn to watch the circulars you know you get them yeah. in the mail mm-hmm. and then it's like oh you know five for five at kroger this week uh, you know uh, half gallons of of almond milk or whatever there's right no yeah. shame in coupons. when i was in college actually um i had a friend whose boyfriend figured out that simply by virtue of being in college, he was eligible for food stamps. And he, he, he immediately went out and got food stamps. <laughs> and he would just go to, like, you know, the frou-frou normal grocery that's, like, downtown or all the yuppies shop, and he would just be all like, oh, how much is that? $400? Let me get out my food stamp. <laughs> you know, like, one food stamp, two food stamp. And people would be like, and he's like, no, whatever, free food. You can turn it down. I won't. Um, so, yeah. so moving to a little bit more on the ground kind of stuff, um, mm-hmm. I'm curious. This is a pain point for me as a guy who tries to manage his finances. Well, my wife does. Thank God she helps me with this and does <laughs> most of it for me because I'm, yeah. Anyway, uh, what what software or system do you guys recommend for managing your money? Uh, and there's clapping going on. <laughs> Just, because I'll tell you, I've tried, I've tried Mint.com, I've tried my banking software, I tried Quicken, uh, simple spreadsheets, and it's all a pain in the tuchus. So what, what do you do, Spike? What I have right now is if you guys go to outright.com, O-U-T-R-I-G-H-T, outright.com, you sign in, you make an account, and then it asks you for the account numbers at your bank. Uh, it asks you for the account numbers of your credit card. It asks you for your PayPal account. And that right there is maybe 90% of the business I do. And um, it will automatically keep track of all your expenses and all your income and categorize them for you. It could get your categories wrong, but then you go in and you tell it, no, when money comes from Amazon, it counts as merchandise sales. And from now on, count all money from Amazon as merchandise sales. And it'll remember. It just keeps everything nice and clean for you. It shows you your net and gross income for the year. At the end of the year, it compiles the tax documents for you if you're using the paid version. It's fantastic, and I love it. Outright.com. I've not. Outright.com. You won't be sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this segment brought to you by. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what do you use, Laura? Um, I actually use Mint.com for my okay. personal stuff and Outright for my, 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 on my business side because I, ha- I have different credit cards so that I can um, uh, separate that out. Um, and I also have something I just found out recently tuition.io. Uh, showcases my loans so that you could tell, you could uh, experiment. There's a sliding scale. You could experiment. If I paid like $75 more, you know, you could be paying this off like six months earlier. So mm. um, that that's something I just found out. And I'm so excited loans. to yeah. see um, it um, visually presented that way. And yeah, um, between those couple of things, and I have a good uh, view of my finances. Like I, I'm a visual learner and just a visual person in general. So it's really a helpful to are, see yeah. a lot of charts and, oh, yeah. okay, I need to be making that thing <laughs> rise instead of like go down. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Now, now, Dave, you are a wealthy librarian. <laughs> <laughs> Let us point out that I'm the 
income scale, librarians are only maybe slightly above cartoonists. <laughs> Cha-ching! <laughs> <laughs> but what, are, did you, what do you use? For I don't. Okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just keep everything in a pile. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I live alone and I have one income source. Okay. So I look at my bank statement every month and make sure that the money was going where I thought it was going and okay. it's coming mm-hmm. in where I thought it was coming in at. Yeah. And, you know, look at my quarterly 403B thing from TIA Cref and see <laughs> if it's grown or shrunk and how soon can I retire, you know, those, <laughs> those sorts of things. Um, but, yeah, I'm not a good person to go to for, for the, financial but, advice. For financial <laughs> advice. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, it does bring up a point about retirement planning. Yes, yeah, so I was oh. good at that. That's where I wanted to go with that is what do you guys do about retirement? Well, uh, I started... Uh, 401k when I was still with my uh, full-time job and then um, once that (laughs) went away I basically moved it to a Vanguard uh, index fund Um, and uh, yeah I've just been steadily sucking a little bit of money away (laughs) over (laughs) over there and just um, I think that one of the best strategies for saving up actually is to automate everything. It's just like have it go just go and you don't have to think about it. Oh, have it have it just uh like deducted D- from your bank yeah, account with, on a withdrawn, regular basis. Yeah, yeah, every month and it just so yeah. you already know you're already planning for it to be part of your, you know, like your monthly budget. So mm-hmm. that's a good So you guys budget. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, extensively definitely we budget <laughs> and uh for savings plans like I said, for the first two or three years when I was cartooning, nothing. I made nothing. And um, my husband had the day job, and I'll never forget it. He would tell me that, you know, you don't have to ever make anything. I think your cartoons are wonderful and the world needs them. And if you never make a dime ever again, uh, you know, da 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 da, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to make money, which was cute, but I have to get paid. So that was always part of the plan. My boyfriend um, is not so kind. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, make we money. Luxury of, he had a very, you know, for a while there, he was working at sort of a, a event planning place. He did their graphic design, and now he works for J.P. Morgan Chase. And um, we're actually working on getting him out of that job so he can come work for me. But um, he has a 401k, mm-hmm. and uh, he has been, you know, moving it with him from job to job. And so... The place he works now, uh, they actually do dollar for dollar matching up to a certain point. Good. So he just has it automatically withdrawn up to that point, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then the dollar for dollar matching happens. And that's our primary retirement uh, planning, planning right now. Mm-hmm. But hopefully, if things continue to go as well for me as they have been going since the middle of 2012, I'd like to start a Roth IRA yeah. because mm-hmm. I a few only a few months ago I had the difference between a traditional and a Roth IRA explained to me, and basically with the traditional IRA, you pay taxes when you put the money into the individual retirement account, but when you withdraw it at retirement age, it's tax free. Or was, no wait no it's the other way around. I think it's the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. No taxes now. Taxes when you withdraw with a traditional with IRA. A traditional. And with a Roth IRA, you pay taxes when you put it in now. now. But when you're 65 and you start drawing on the account, it's tax free. That's. And mm-hmm. the way it was explained to me, taxes are at a historic low, so you might as well pay them now. Now. And um, there's a five thousand dollar a year limit for Roth IRAs, and I would like to do that. <laughs> until I'm maybe 65 yeah. and, and see how that goes. Yeah. So how often do you guys check in with your budgets? Constantly. Constantly. Well, okay, constantly. Every, day. Every, day. every day. Every day I check and see uh, income. I check and see expenses. I check and see what's in the bank. Um, primarily, I lost my wallet a few months ago, so that mm-hmm. kind of started me making sure there weren't any weird charges. And oh, I, I kind of kept in the habit. And uh, I'm the one who's in charge of paying the bills. So when the bills come in, I make sure there are no weird charges on them. I, I'm completely about the finances. Mm-hmm. So things cool. like outright.com or mint.com help with that? With that like, outright oh, is yeah. fantastic, yeah. seriously. Mm-hmm. Is it? And it's okay. free, so you've got like, nothing to lose, so you yeah. should try it out. Yeah. I yeah. will, because one of the things that I got frustrated about with Mint is that it constantly reassigned categories to in- incoming items, even if I said, no, if it comes from that address, that's groceries. That's Kroger. I, that, <laughs> you know, for out loud, I told you it's Kroger. And then it's like, are you sure this isn't gasol- gasoline and uh, you know, auto expenses? No. You know, so... 
Mm -hmm. uh, if, if outright can actually learn that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've never had that problem with outright. Mm -hmm. When you tell it, you know, this belongs in category C, it stays in category C. Mm. That's yeah. exciting. So we're getting lots of uh, lots of chiming in. From, wow, the chat is really active today, and I got to think it's because we have a really good roundtable and lots of folks turned out for it. And folks are, are are chiming in saying yes, automation is a big big deal. Like automating the, mm -hmm. those those bills. Uh, uh, what about uh, paying your quarterly taxes? Is that automated, or is that something where you guys are checking in? My situation's kind of weird. Um, outright does its best, truly it does, <laughs> to uh, understand my situation, but it never will, Where, it, which is like the way the Kickstarters go and the way my uh, income goes. You know, this month I'll make this m piddling amount, piddling amount, piddling amount, <laughs> holy crap, piddling, yeah. amount, piddling, amount, piddling amount, holy crap, and it doesn't know what to do. So it's like on Monday it'll say your quarterly task tax estimate is Five hundred eighty-three dollars, and then your quarterly task tax estimate is now somehow sixteen thousand dollars. Yeah, so it yeah. tries, but I don't have regular income. That's so that's I the honestly, tricky part. Yeah. At the end I of the day, I just either. pay the penalty at the end of the year for now. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and I mean that's that's one of the things that I've struggled with probably the most is uh, it fluctuates year to year. One year I have an awesome year, then then for the next year it's terrible, you know. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, on the terrible year, am I going to pay the estimated taxes that I paid last year? Right? Because that's what they tell you to do. It's like, well, just estimate what you did last year. Well, last year I had an awesome year, and this first quarter sucked. So yeah. you know, so that's one of the the trickier parts to manage, I think. Um, and it's not like in comics you can't schedule out your year like, well, in July I'm gonna be making this much, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like the work for hire thing where, like, in, I, I do freelance. Do you guys do freelance work too? Very rarely. I have to be super into the job. I recently did an Adventure Time cover for the for the ah. April mm -hmm. issue, and that was because I like Adventure Time. <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, no. Okay, but yeah, like with with when you're doing work for hire freelance stuff, you can sometimes schedule that out. Like, okay, well, I got yeah. a gig coming in this summer that I can count on. But otherwise, yeah, that one is tricky. Mm -hmm. um, Scott Yoshinaga of nemu nemucom is in the chat. Mm -hmm. He's suggesting if you got if you're on iOS, there's a, a a receipt tracking application called One Receipt. I've been thinking about this too, like either using Evernote or an app like One Receipt to actually like scan my receipts because if I put them in my wallet and they stay there for too long, with that stupid uh, well, what what is that kind of ink called? It's not even ink. It's like it's sort of like scratched into the receipt. It yeah. wears oh, off. Oh. Yeah, the heat, the heat transferred receipts or whatever. Is that, is that what you're saying, Matt? You just Thank you, Matt. You got a blank piece of paper. Yeah. You got a blank piece of paper, right? <laughs> what so, was this? What? what? <laughs> do you guys do you guys uh, track all your receipts when you're doing conventions and traveling and um, I do. I write off the taxi I took. Uh, if but since I have outright, I try to pay for as many things as possible with a credit card because mm. that way it's automatically it's a, tracked yeah. for me. And for a while, you know, people were, I was told many, many times, like, oh, no, 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 the IRS does not accept electronic stuff. You have to keep the receipt. And then if you go to the IRS website, the IRS is like, no. <laughs> <laughs> They're fine. It, it actually has a MIDI file that plays that for you. I keep track of receipts, but I don't do it with great, you know, I, I, I'm not very organized about it what i have is a grocery bag like a plastic produce bag mm -hmm. with the year on it and the receipts <laughs> go in there okay and, you know if i need a receipt it's 10 times easier to look it up online than it is because it's all in my credit card state and my credit card statement goes back a billion years and oh um how was this a business dinner let's see yes it happened on the weekend of this con so business dinner yeah, yeah okay. i just have those like little organizers with the months on them mm -hmm. and you just start, you start placing receipts over there and like once a month i'll be going over them and um either putting them in my little excel sheet or um just making sure that i have them either on my outright or um yeah just just reflected somewhere else <laughs> yeah so yeah. so that there's there's a case for paying for everything with plastic mm -hmm. that uh that makes it more trackable mm -hmm. in the long run for you as a cartoon yeah definitely yeah. so okay well now i want to close out with talking about managing sales and laura mm -hmm. you in particular I, I i i would imagine you have a challenge on your hands because you got your book Poltergeist mm -hmm. everywhere. It's on iBooks. It's on, or I mean, uh, the what is it? The Apple Bookstore, iBookstore, uh, Amazon. Um, oh gosh, where else is it? Uh, um, Store Envy, my Store Envy, personal Gumroad. website, but Gumroad. Gumroad. Gumroad's pretty awesome. Gumroad. 
Gumroad, yes. Yeah. Gumroad is pretty sweet. Yeah. I, I'm in love with Gumroad, actually. And, yeah. I send it little notes and stuff. It's <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I just put one of my books on Gumroad, and I was really mm-hmm. pleasantly surprised with the uptake on it. And I did like the free money, the, basically. Yeah, the pay yeah. what you want model, right? I just said, here's my 200 something page graphic novel, pay whatever you want for it, even zero, and lots and lots of zero downloads. But then, like, some people were paying like double what I expected to get, you mm-hmm. know? That, that is really cool. Then that, that, we go into the whole thing about Ryan Estrada and his whole story project with yeah. uh, this whole like Ryan but- is a good dude I love Ryan oh <laughs> Ryan, Ryan is the author of the Porcraft sequel by the way oh, oh well who better as the uh. world traveler who is exactly yeah. and, and yeah. who's most equipped you know and, and, and he posts his, his finances openly online I don't know if you guys saw that that post oh, he yeah. did where he was showing like here's how I made my money this year and this is where all my yep. income streams came from uh, super open and generous with his knowledge. So the, I am looking forward to that. Yeah, Ryan is the best. Mm-hmm. I call him my Obi-Wan Kenobi ghost. Whenever I have trouble, <laughs> I just turn to, to my Ryan Estrada ghost who says, no, this is what you need to do, pal. I'm like, oh, thanks. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, pros and cons of these different fulfillment, because you use OpenCart, Spike, right? Yes, I, I think I do. I, yeah, I do, I do. Um, I use OpenCart. It's that um, open source um, shopping cart thing mm-hmm. I've got going on. I use open cart to sell on my site. Uh, I use Gumroad to sell PDFs because I didn't want to just stick a PDF on, up on the site with a link that one person can buy and then copy paste the link and go like, Hey everybody who wants free porn. <laughs> and, uh, I use, all right. So Gumroad open cart. I also sell on Amazon, which has been surprisingly good. And, and I'm getting set up with comiXology right now. Uh, after letting it just sort of lie there for way too long, selling only poor craft and completely ignoring poor craft. Uh, oh, we're getting some latency. Right we're getting we're getting some like, bit crushing. Hey, Spike. Sorry, right, hold on. Okay, sorry. Uh, no, just Skype is just saying like, oh, hey, I'm having trouble uh, processing all of this. Awesome am I still stuff. here? Yes, yeah. you're here. Okay. There we are. Yeah, multiple income streams. That's <laughs> definitely important. <laughs> So, okay, but th- this has got to require a lot of work on your part, first of all. When we talk about, like, managing priorities. You have to have an entrepreneurial spirit. If you're the kind of person this, – this isn't meant to sound cruel, by the way. If you're the kind of person who comes up to me at a con and they go, I, I've had this happen. I want to be sitting where you're sitting one day. How did you get there? And you interrupt me halfway through my spiel and you go, but, but I just, I just want to draw. Well, that's fine, but then you don't want to do what I do because, like, these days, I'd say 40% of my day has nothing to do with cartooning. You you want to work for somebody who hands you work and then you draw it and then you hand it in and they hand you money. That's what you want to do. Me, I do my own accounting. I, I, do, I organize my own travel. I organize my own appearances. My speaking gigs, I do that. Everything is completely me, sole proprietorship. And it's you just have to wear many different hats if you want to be out there on your own completely alone um we're we're coming up to book recommendation segment and, and i know that that was a hard segue but and i want to be respectful <laughs> of of, of laurianne's time because i know you got to go pretty mm-hmm. soon here so um do you want to do your book recommendations yeah, and then sure. and then you can bolt uh laurianne uh i, I but i want to say so this is where we can say something about your work okay if you yeah. enjoyed what Lorianne <laughs> talked about today and what she contributed to the conversation, you do this little book called Poltergeist, Yay. which is a story about a uh, young college gal young and five nerdy college girl who ends up moving into a house that's filled with uh, ghost guys. So, um, so are she's they hot? The, <laughs> yes, <laughs> they're hot. Um, we have, and since she's the only one that can see them, she has to help them resolve their unfinished business. So, um, and it's their little adventures there. And this is the first book out of a uh, series. And you're working on the second book now. I'm working on the second book now, you're along with a uh, uh, little PDF of extra material because I ran out of time uh, when I was creating this book to finish up the extra. So um, th- I'm finishing that up for my Kickstarter backers. And um, just for anyone who's interested in like how I made that first book happen, the Zarek Grant, the Kickstarter, um, extra material like the house in Berkeley that I actually researched for um, the the book, it, and yeah, just an, um, just stuff that you want <laughs> you want more of. <laughs> it's a very very pretty and very fun and sometimes haunting 
book. Uh, uh-huh. uh, well, I see no, what I, you did there. I, I, I was, I, I, believe it or not, everybody, I actually wasn't trying for a thing. That's oh, <laughs> That was terrible. <laughs> I meant that there were parts that were emotionally arresting in okay. the story. Not, oh, God. Uh, I'm that guy. <laughs> I'll see you guys on CBS <laughs> later on today. <laughs> but I'm sitting sh- next to Matt Lauer making bad jokes. God. Uh, but... Um, but anyway, no, it, it's it's really, really nicely done, and uh, that's at laurabetz.com, mm-hmm. is what we should say. So, okay, so now we'll recommend some other books that you enjoy that um, may have informed Poltergeist. Well, not, not quite informed, but, but just some stuff that I've been enjoying mm-hmm. recently. Um, we've got, let's see, can you see that? Hey, you can get it in the shot. Bakuman, which um, has been, uh, has had some, like, a reputation for being, like, kind of misogynistic, and yes, I acknowledge <laughs> that th- there are some elements of it that... <laughs> <laughs> that are quite <laughs> but um i I've, I've been really enjoying the past few volumes because it's about manga artists and their struggle to like connect with their audience and to um especially the 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 manga artist industry in Japan it's very very competitive very very high stakes you know if you slip down your ratings um from week to week it, it oh, yeah. it's like it spells like the end for you, you know, in mm-hmm. your career, and it's all—it's all just exciting. Like you know, the comics industry hyped up so much because, like, you know, they care so much about comics, and it's just a really fun world to to be in. Mm-hmm. Um, meanwhile, we have like Oku. I'm trying to show you. That There's a preview book. right up There's there. A, there. Uh, there. Yeah. There. And um, this one just speaks to my Japanese art history nerd. In in me because I took Japanese art history in 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 Berkeley and it's just like gender politics and feudal Japan Ooh. because you you get like a why the last man kind of scenario where like over half of the male population dies out and so like women start slowly taking over um, you know uh, authority figures and um, even the shogun's female so. Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's it it just rocks, and I, I haven't read um, a manga that's just like made my jaw drop like every volume. So it's a, just just some exciting stuff I've been reading. And for the local lately. folks, these are both in the library's collection. Yes, I <laughs> grabbed these from the library. <laughs> that's awesome. Which is another way to save money when you're a cartoonist. Actually, there we <laughs> go. Exactly, go the guys. It's Warcraft that tells you to go to the library. <laughs> that's really awesome. Yeah, either if you go to the Ann Arbor District Library or to the Duderstadt, uh, the Dude, as they say, where there's even more comics. Um, so, wow, thank you, Laura, for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, your your Laura Bits on Twitter mm-hmm. and, and LauraBits.com. LauraBits.com is my main website. Everybody should go follow Laura Bits on Twitter today. And uh, we'll definitely have to have you back while you're here in Ann Arbor. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, yes, thanks again. We'll, we'll let you go, and uh, we'll t- talk with Dave and Spike while Sharon Iverson comes in. That's right, everybody. Sharon Iverson is in the building, Woo-hoo! and she's coming on to the show <laughs> in just a minute. Everybody's waiting with bated breath. So, see you, Laura. And, uh, Hi, so- Laura. Nice meeting you. Oh, she says it's nice meeting you. Oh. She took her, took her <laughs> headphones off. <laughs> she says when her headphones are all the way off. <laughs> Okay, see ya. So, Spike, I want to talk about your work a little bit just for a second. Can I recommend my comics, too? Oh, sure, sure. Um, I want to recommend comics that are not by me first before we get into it. Okay. Just because um, I feel like it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm kind of really excited about some of these. Please. Um, I don't even know why I'm recommending this because uh, you're not going to find it. But... This is a comic from ages ago. Oh, it's yay. Called, That's <laughs> Luke. annoying Post Brothers. And it is about two guys from a town called Bugtown. And Bugtown's best description is, it's anywhere it wants to be. It is a town that can dimensionally shift, and so can all the inhabitants of Bugtown. And those annoying Post Brothers live in Bugtown. And it's by Matt Haworth and Lou Stathis. And this is one of the comics that I had in mind when I was doing my own comics about a weird town full of weird, horrible people. <laughs> and again, it's the series is Those Annoying Post Brothers, and this particular volume is Das Loot. 
Yes, and I, I believe the early issues are on Comixology now, if you can't find Ooh, cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, so, yeah, so. check out Matt Haworth. He's really weird and interesting and completely different. He's kind of from the old school of alternative comics. It's, yeah, it's good stuff. He was doing digital comics back when he was mailing you your comics on a, on a three-and-a-half-inch floppy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so he's an this early is, pioneer in digital. This is something else I'm not entirely sure, sure you'll be able to find. Uh, but this is Pug Davis by Rebecca Sugar, who, if you're a nerd, you might recognize as the creator of Steven Universe, the new Cartoon Network series that's coming up soon. She also worked a lot on Adventure Time. And this was her webcomic about an astronaut who used to be a janitor at NASA, and he got caught in a horrible explosion, and for some reason when they put him back together, they gave him the head of a dog. <laughs> so now he lives in space with his little sidekick, the blouse. And the blouse is in space because NASA wanted to test zero gravity's effects on homosexuality. And uh, wow. then they just left him out there because he's the kind of guy people bully a lot. And so he kind of... He kind of turns to Pug for a lot of protection, and he kind of has a crush on Pug. But Pug is a very unenlightened, blue-collar kind of dude who simultaneously wants to protect the blouse because the blouse is just a punching bag for the universe <laughs> and like doesn't want to encourage these affections. But it's excellent, and if you can find it anywhere, grab it. And one more thing. Okay. That's not mine. This is The Less Than Epic Adventures of TJ and Amal. It is another webcomic, and it is by E.K. Weaver. Uh, you can probably get them direct from her. This is just volume one of three, and it is a love story between these two guys that's also about a cross-country road trip. Amal, who is the little dude with white forelock, just came out to his family that did not take it well, and uh, TJ just has issues and it's a really good book anyway that's so, that's so all it's, it's, a, it's a buddy are. a buddy road trip story and a romance mm -hmm. at the same time and a romance at the same time yeah cool i guess you could put it in the you know yaoi category but when i think yaoi i do not think of stuff this excellent and deep maybe i'm just reading bad yaoi <laughs> <laughs> i also noticed the subtitle had poor boys and it does that fit the theme of today's talk <laughs> yeah. it, it might poor boys, poor boys, and, boys pil and pilgrims oh so there's sharon iverson everybody who are just listening in the audience Segway. <laughs> Sharon Iverson of the Ann Arbor District Library Comics.aedl.org. Thank you for being here again, Sharon. Sure. sure. Uh, so I guess we could just go on full on into book recommendations and we'll close out with Spike stuff because you got some exciting yeah. stuff going on. So uh, what do you got for us, Sharon? Well, um, I see that Poltergeist was already mentioned. So I went yep. ahead and uh, I brought it just in case there was going to be no discussion or showing of Poltergeist. I also brought um, volume three, which I think has been out a little while, of Gunnar Craig Court. And um, it's, it's a thumbs up from Spike. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it is such an adventure. I mean, this one has anything from robots to, oh, and I just took my bookmark out. The colors, of course, the, the whole work is fascinating. But it's, you know, it's got coyote, wolf. I mean, it's, it just is such an amazing blend of, um, you know, storyline of, you know, what's going on with the characters um, it's, of course, a school. Gunnar Creek Court is a residential school for kids to develop into mediums. Um, and Antimony Carver is the lead character in it. And she is a little bit like Harry Potter um, in that her mother has passed away. Her father's just pretty much dumped her at the school, and here she is. So um, she's having to kind of find her way and find her powers and so forth. And it's just... I just loved uh, from the simulation that starts off the book um, through the backstory of the robot and who is this Miss Jean that um, nobody in the current day Gunnar Creek Court seems to know about except Antimony and her friend Kat um, to, to uh, all sorts of other things. So anyway, I just... Cool. Whenever I can get, and I had to wait a while for this. <laughs> one, so now this it, started out as a webcomic. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, I, I don't know, is it winter time and I get stuck on war stuff? Um, <laughs> I blogged this on the comics.adl.org, and this is volume one of Charlie's War, the one volume that we do have in our library collection, but I have Michigan e library 
which means I've borrowed outside of the system two other volumes um, because it's a compelling story about a World War One 16 year old Charlie Bourne who um, enters into the British Army just in time for the Battle of Somme. And the Battle of Somme will see on its first day a casualty list of 60,000. Um, it's the it's brilliantly done by Pat Mills, and I do not know how to say Joe Colquan. Colquan? Colquan? Um, who does the artwork, and this is all in black and white. It's very detailed. Um, there are battles, um, of course, in the trenches, out in no man's land. I would call this Eisner-esque. What do you say, Dave? Yeah. In, in terms of art style, for those yeah, who are listening in the, the audio, yeah, or more, uh, more the EC, yeah, uh, EC um, era, EC era war comics. I mean, yeah. it's that's quite a compliment. And yeah. and and these were like. I guess four-page uh, comics that came through a magazine of its time. So each, every so many pages, you get a, a recap, and then you move forward with the story. So this is a compilation. I don't know if there's like five volumes all together, but um, it's it's so amazing, and the the effort to get the history and the you know the art right is just incredible. Um, I, I went on to watch a. Well, an Australian film done about the uh, Beneath Hill 60, where the Australians attempt to set off a series of mines, which at that time would be the largest explosion. It was in Belgium, but felt in London. Wow. Um, and, and again, it takes you down into that trench warfare, and you just can't imagine what the conditions were like. But the artwork and the storyline and the characters just draw you into the trenches with them. So it's... Fabulous. Here's here's your influence at work. Argets in the chat is saying we've been tutoring the neighborhood kid and he's just starting World War One in history class. I might pick this up for him. I, yeah. If you're, if you're in Ann Arbor, then it's in the Ann Arbor District That's Library right. Collection. Yeah. Hi, Argets. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dave. So I didn't bring any recommendations with me. Okay. But but uh, we could talk about the library where. Yeah, why don't, That's one big fat recommendation, yeah, right? Why don't we Why don't we do that? Yes. <laughs> please. The reason I came here today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, longtime listeners of the show may remember last year when we talked about Mini Comics Day at the Duder Stamp right. Center, and we did a whole session after it. Um, we, uh, myself, and one of the participants talked about what we did there and talked about the Mini Comics, and we're doing it again this year. It'll be Saturday, March sixteenth. At the Duderstadt Center on North Campus here in Ann Arbor. I love mini comics. From ten <laughs> <laughs> from ten a.m. to six p.m. Um, and the 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 goal is to get a bunch of people in the same room creating comics. Um, your your the stated goal is to create an eight page mini comics can, comic in eight hours. So it's kind of like a mini version of twenty four hour comics day. It uh, just it won't kill you. <laughs> <laughs> or it might. Or, well, it might. <laughs> um, and then um, so. Uh, we want to get uh, cartoonists in the area together to to socialize and create all at the same time. Um, so there will be students from the University of Michigan and other cartoonists uh, from the area who like will me showing up, and people like me who do one eight-page comic a year at Mini Comics Day <laughs> 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 in my wonderful stick figure fashion <laughs> for that. Phoebe Glockner yeah. often comes to yep, this Phoebe thing. Phoebe and her she's bringing her class, her uh, comics creating class, mm -hmm. uh, School of Art and Design. They'll be coming cool. in to do that. Um, so be a great opportunity. And then our, our secret agenda is <laughs> that we ask you to give a copy of your mini comics to us for the mini comics collection that we have at the university library. Um, we started this collection three, three, four years ago, I think. One of my grad students, uh, Stephanie Grimm, um, started as her graduate project. She's. We're gonna I think I met her that. at SPX. She used to go to SPX yes. on, on uh, mini comics finding missions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And cool. so um, now we, we get these unique mini comics that we, and they were created nowhere else. Um, we then add them to the library's collection. We catalog them. We put them in the catalog. We put them in a uh, acid free envelope that and, so and cool. store them for eternity. You have a, a, a really impressive collection of chick tracks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love those. <laughs> they are so great. And he's got he's got a, a, a ton of them, like every single one almost. Yeah, we got uh, actually Phoebe donated it to us. This <laughs> this it's this gorgeous looking box and it's full of all these little chick tracks that were yeah. in it and so those are all available to folks and um so yeah it's one of the things we try to do with the collection collection at the library is not just collect the you know the popular stuff that's out there that people are reading but we want to get a sense of what 
what was going on down in the trenches and stuff that people are doing and try to get those rare things mm -hmm. uh, so that, you know, 20, 30 years from now, when people are trying to look back at your career, uh, we've got a copy of that first little mini comic yeah. that you created when you were a student. What uh, a horrifying thought. <laughs> 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 That's Dave's job. He's kind of like that episode of Twilight Zone where Mr. French was the devil. Yeah, this SPX, or rather last SPX, somebody showed up with... I mean, these mini comics were so old, I submitted them to Fact Sheet 5. And like 90% oh, of people have wow. no idea what that is. <laughs> Fact Sheet 5, and that's going back. He showed up with them and made me sign them. And I was oh. not cringing the entire time because these are literally high school. I'm 34. And he shows up the comics <laughs> I made when I was 14. I wanted to die inside. Embrace your history. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You own it. <laughs> so, so I think, what was the first reference you made to this episode, which was like to like us? Uh, some old web serving technology. I forget which one you referred yeah. to. Oh, whether it was user not. Use that. User and user. then you refer to Fact Sheet 5. Man, deep cuts into comics history today. So, so I, should, <laughs> I should mention for people who want to participate in Mini Comics Day, yes. um, you can go to lib.umich.edu slash Mini Comics Day. Yep. Um, that will have um, all the information about this year's uh, event and a form. Click, fill out the form. Uh, to let us know that you're coming. You don't have to fill out the form to show up, but it would be nice if I had some idea of how many people to buy chips for. Um, yeah, because so there are refreshments. That's the yeah, other we'll nice thing that you do for we'll, everybody. We'll have Free food, that's pork rough. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's true, yeah. <laughs> Free food while you're drawing your comics. Exactly. And that's March 16th from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Yep, that's and just a Saturday. And we did an episode, a wrap-up from last year, which I'll link in the show notes for this episode. But uh, i got to say... You know, the, something I talked about when we had that discussion is whenever I do a creative project, there is that I conquer that first third of it, and then the dread sets in of, oh, my God, I'm a hack. I'm no good. Every project. <laughs> it happens every time. This is this is garbage. I don't have any faith in this. Uh, every, I, th when I finish this, everybody's going to see me for the fraud I am. And then you get past it. <laughs> and then you push through and you get past it. And then you go, hey, this isn't so bad. It looks like a thing. And it was really cool in that environment with all those other people that when that moment hit, I got to express it and then everybody else is like yeah i'm there too man <laughs> or or there's the somebody saying like like no don't worry just keep keep punching you'll get through but you have that yeah. camaraderie no jersey that's really good <laughs> <laughs> pet me on the head <laughs> <laughs> but anyway you got that commiseration you have that camaraderie in this kind of everybody's in this this dire struggle for completing a mini comic together and it was really fun and i think a lot of cartoonists Kind of feel like they're working alone. You know, they're they're home yeah. at their home at their drafting board or whatever, or aren't sitting at their computer, and they're not having that interaction. And this is a chance to get out and create comics, kind of sort of communally. Uh, yeah, yeah. Folks. So, so that's at uh, what is it? Live. Umich. Edu slash Mini Comics Day. We'll link to it in the show notes. So, thank you, Dave. And then you are at Dave Reed's Comics on Twitter. So we can get updates about it from there, right? Oh, yes. I'll be t tweeting about it <laughs> <laughs> nonstop between now and then. Okay. So now, Spike, uh, yeah. you got this thing called Smut Peddler, which we got to talk about. As a matter of fact, Jersey, I do. This is now the oh, blue look. portion of the show. This, this <laughs> is where like, it's blue. <laughs> Don Rickles is here. <laughs> oh, look. <laughs> so thick. Anyway, um, yeah, this is Smut Peddler. It was on Kickstarter. This is what I saved up pretty much every dime for, even though I didn't know it when I was first starting to save. This is based on a series of mini comics that were published in the early bodies, appropriately enough, <laughs> by Saucy Goose Press. And if you look very carefully, you can see the little homage to Saucy Goose at the top of the smut peddler. Oh, you lower it just a little bit. A little goose. And it was published by Joanna Draper Carlson and Trisha L. Sebastian. And what it was was pretty much all the alternative comics people who were super hot at the time and many who still are uh, made adult stories, adult stories they wanted to make, the sexy stories they wanted to make. And they put out three issues of this and they were digest mini. So, you know, you take an eight and a half, 11 sheet by pa of paper, fold it in half. That's what a digest mini size is. And uh, there were three of them, like I said, and then there weren't any. <laughs> and uh, I would find the people who were in Smut Peddler at cons and harass them and be like, when's there going to be more Smut Peddler? When's there going to be more Smut Peddler? And then one day, Carlos McNeil, who was a participant in Smut Peddler, and still is, uh, said, you do it. And I was like, haha, that's funny. <laughs> and then I went home and I tweeted while thinking out loud to myself, and they say Twitter is useless. I tweeted and I said, I wonder if Carlo was for real. 
And Carl's like, uh, yes. <laughs> and then all the editors pretty much said, yeah, you know, if you want to do this, we would not have a problem with it and we would like to be involved. And uh, that's where Smut Peddler came from. It's basically me emailing people, my husband as well, and we sat down. It's like, who do we want to see draw porn? <laughs> Middle list. And we emailed those people and a lot of them responded. They got a page rate. And they got a bonus, and they got comp copies. So, you know, I run a fair game. And when this was put on Kickstarter, the goal was $20,000 to cover print, printing costs. And you cleared it ended 80. ended up doing $83,000. Not bad. Wow. At the time it closed out, it was the ninth successful comic book Kickstarter. So I'm very proud of that. And I'd open it up and show you the interior, but... You know, this, yeah, this is just, the, you'll have to take my word for it. This is a safe for work show. And the stories are very fun and sexy. And uh, I would like to do one of these every two years. And it was a great project. It endowed me via Kickstarter with a life changing amount of money. <laughs> and it produced something I am super, super, super proud of. And you can get that on Amazon. You can get it at ironcircus.com. You can get a PDF on Gumroad. It is available many ways, and that is my latest Kickstarter project. So we will have to see about getting that added to the adult mm -hmm. collection at the Ann yeah. Arbor District Library. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and then also Porecraft is available at the Ann Arbor District Library mm -hmm. if you're in the area. And it, it is available. You offer this the same way, right? It's, you can get the, the book or you can get a PDF. Uh, book, PDF. It's going to be on Comixology soon. Um, it's on Amazon right now. It's on ironcircus.com right now. It's on gumroad.now. It's actually linked to in the Gumroad FAQ, believe it or not. When you go to Gumroad and you say, what is Gumroad? They provide a direct link to Porecraft. Cool. Uh, this is kind of the book I wish someone had gotten me when I was 16, 17, 18. Th this, um, this is the, this is the is 21st century. This Kickstarter book. This is the 21st century's Oh, the Places You'll Go. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Oh, man. <laughs> That's been quoted multiple times. All that the things my, you I mean, won't AD be able to afford. And Ryan Estrada put it on the back. And that everything. might be where I got it. And uh, I wrote it. Uh, I didn't draw it. Diana Diana Nock drew it there. And she might be in chat. So, hey. And, um, she's, she's here. Yeah, it was my – this was – I heard of Kickstarter from another cartoonist named Gordon McAlpin. And we were on stage at – I think it was Windy City Con – and we were doing a panel, and he just casually mentioned this thing in 2009 called Kickstarter. And I was like, what's that? He explained it, and there was a beat, and I went, cool. <laughs> and I immediately went home and began planning this project. And um, in 2009, it made $13,000 on Kickstarter after asking for 6000 And, you know, $13,000 was like a mind-blowing amount of money <laughs> on Kickstarter back then. And uh, two years in the making... And it was published to sparkling reviews. Uh, it's got um, some quotes on the back from cartoonists I respect, so hooray for that. And it is a mere $10 for a hard copy and $5 for a PDF because it seems dumb charging more than that for a book on how to be poor. Right. <laughs> <As it's> <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, I mean, it's a great book. I'm super proud of it the same way I'm super proud of Smut Peddler. Um, I'm giving away copies to women's shelters in the Chicago area. So if you know a worthy shelter that might be interested in putting these in what are called starting over kits, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to send them a few copies, see what they think. Cool. And uh, yeah, it's a great book, great gift, great to learn stuff from. I love it. Um. So I, 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 I want to also say that if you enjoyed any of the discussion that we had today, people who were listening to the, this after the fact or watching the show, uh, all, there's more in the book. And I would also throw on, you know, I was coloring this whole conversation as being pertaining to cartoonists, but as you just pointed out, Porecraft, I think, would apply to anybody who's Anyone, trying to live yeah. one on less. Same with Smut Peddler. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, also, this is the latest volume of my webcomic, my sad, neglected webcomic, which is finally updating again, called Templar, Arizona. It's an alternate history comic. And it has recently gone full color. So if you're interested in full color comics about unfortunate people living in terrible places, check it out at <laughs> templaraz.com. Templaraz.com. And it is looking lovely, Spike. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, okay, and then, you know, going from Smut Peddler to another Kickstarter, I see you got on your iPad there. I think we should give a shout out to this Kickstarter. Yes. It just started called so started, All Yeah Comics. So they started yesterday. Oh, so I saw that. That's doing yeah. really well. Art Baltazar and Franco, who um, did 50 issues of Tiny Titans and 
sadly, only 12 issues of Superman Family Adventures for DC most recently. Um, and right after it was announced that that comic was ending, uh, just a few days later, they announced their All Yeah Comics Kickstarter. So they're creating their own characters. Um, and But it looks like it's very much in the style of, of those previous offerings that they had. Um, so they are committing to doing six issues of this, and they've already have they've already met their goal. They said if we get fifteen thousand <laughs> yeah, dollars, we're doing in within less than a day. They they met it, and so now they're saying if we get thirty thousand, we're doing twelve issues of this. Um, and for your support on that, you will get either digital or print copies um, of this comic. So look at it as pre-ordering if you if you'd like for that. Um, and uh, those are some of my some of my favorite comics that have come out from the big guys yeah. um, in the last several years. Just fun. If Superman you, family stuff? Yeah. And yeah. If, if, you like your, if you like your superhero comics full of fun... Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> ah, there we go. Here, let's see if we can turn it around and we can show it on the yeah. camera. Zoom. I can zoom in here. Well... Oh, <laughs> no. we're, we're being if we can spin if it around, there we go. stands oh. on their heads, they there can see it. So, yeah. yes, Art Balthazar... Need we say more? But yeah, if you're a fan of, of superheroes, but fun superheroes, yeah, right? Yeah, and so um, uh, I I think it's worth supporting. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I put my money where my mouth was <laughs> on that. Um, so yeah, and we didn't talk much about Kickstarter as a way of, of funding your... That was on my list. So Spike, I yes. um, I implore you to come back to talk about Kickstarter. I would that, love to. Yeah, I think okay. you could do a whole show on oh, Kickstarter. Oh, easy. So. Yeah, we definitely... And as well Absolutely. as, as, as Lorianne. I mean, because she's mm -hmm. doing a talk at the um, library yep, next month. March 3. Yeah, Lorianne's going to talk about her experience with Kickstarter. So, yep, yep. definitely. A whole podcast about Kickstarter, a whole broadcast about Kickstarter sounds like a great idea, and I'm totally down if you'll have me. Awesome. Okay, well, then I we, my people will call your people, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, my poor people will call your poor people. In, in other words, I will email you. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Spike, for this. Re you. This was an awesome episode. Uh, thank you, Dave. Oh, Man. thanks for having me. And uh, everybody should come out to uh, Mini Comics Day in March. Uh, I will be there. I'll be able to have a chance to hang out with me if if uh, if, if, if Dave isn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, and then and then thank you, Sharon, for sure. showing up, and sure. thank you to Lorianne Oi, uh, and uh, thanks to Matt Dubay in the control room for putting this show together every two weeks. Uh, I know I'm prematurely aging the man, and I appreciate the years <laughs> that I'm sucking out of your life <laughs> putting this show on. Thanks to Eric Closer in the chat. He's been in the chat client the whole time webchat.freenode.net the uh, channel hashtag CAG posting links to everything we've been talking about for all the folks oh. thank, thanks to everybody who showed up in the chat Diana Nock was in there and uh, Scott Yoshinaga <laughs> John Obalier and a uh, whole mess more uh, this show will be archived at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG72 and you can follow us on YouTube at comicsaregreat.tv and you can read Sharon's uh, excellent book reviews on comics.aadl.org. Until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Drozd of comicsgreat.com and Jersey on the Twitters. Okay, bye.